So much to be thankful for. So much to be thankful for, our Lord, that we can rejoice and praise the Lord and give thanks to you, Lord. And our heart is in it, Lord. Our heart is in it. Lord, it's not just words, but it is from the heart. And we thank you, Lord, for what you've done for each and every one of us to give us a desire to serve you. And we thank you, Lord, that you are giving us truth concerning righteousness. And Lord, we cherish that and help us not to sell it, Lord. Help us not to sell it, but to preserve the truth of God. Bless the people that are here and in the house, Lord. Grant that no one leaves tonight without receiving something from you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We'll turn to Psalms 18. Verses 20 through 24, same ones we read this morning. 20, Psalms 18, verses 20 through 24. If you weren't here this morning, I invite you to get the tape of the morning and also Earl Clampett's tape, either the video or the audio, because we both spoke on the same subject. And one was kind of a continuation of the other. So you might enjoy the tape that Earl made this morning in the follow-up. And they were defining terms. All right, Psalms 18, verse 20. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands has he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. Now, first of all, let us define righteousness so it's not vague in our minds. Righteousness proceeds along three lines. One is the love of the world. And one is... Uh, the lust and excesses of our flesh. And the third one is self-will. Now these, in these three realms is where we fight the battle of righteousness. In our love of the world and finding security in the world and pleasure in the world, of which the television is probably the most conspicuous example, addiction to television, and Secondly, the lust of our flesh, whether it's just uh, sexual lust or perversion or drugs, or the various uh, violence and rages that boil up in our flesh, or envy and jealousy, and these things that are in our flesh that are so hard to combat. If you're a person given to rage and violence, it's very hard to overcome that thing and to refrain from cursing and lashing out and hurting somebody. If you love the world, it's very difficult to leave the things of the world. And Christian people dabble in the world. Man, they're, they're old people, here they are in their latter days sitting frozen, glued to the television. They have no, no more in life than that. It's like a withering plant that is just existing day by day until finally it atrophies and dies. I've seen people, and I tell you they are very scarce, who have really served God. And as they get into their latter days, they are prophets. I tell you to be near them, to hear two words out of their mouth is to be illuminated. And others the same age are just almost like vegetables. 
And what it is, it's a reaping of what we have sown. And that churches have not stressed righteousness uh, for a reason we may be mentioning a little later. But I just want to keep it real simple tonight because when we say righteousness, you know your brain can buzz all over the place. It has to do with the love of the world. You can index that with your love of television. If you can stand that thing, if you can stand it, you've got some praying to do because it's nothing but the world. And there's nothing in that for us anymore. Maybe 20 years ago, but not today. There's nothing in that for Christian people. Uh, you know, I wish I could go over to Las, Las Vegas for a holiday. I wish I'd just get out and kick up my heels. Well, it's human. But it is an evidence that we're very immature in the Lord, that we have to take our joy, or that we find our security in money and investment. And this is where our heart is in the world. That is one area of sin. And righteousness is when you get the victory over that. And you want to love the Lord and, and your mind is filled with the things of heaven and of God. As it says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And that's quite a tear for us. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of determination. It takes a lot of work walking in God. To really overcome the love of things and to transfer that upstairs to a desire to be with the Lord. And all of you know that's true. It takes a lot of doing to break that hole that the world has on us. And in the area of lust and violence and rage and the things that work in our flesh and rise up within us and we want to curse and we want to strike out and we want to fornicate and we want to do perverse things, that also has a mighty grip on some people. Some lose their very characters and their lives over alcohol or homosexuality or something of this kind. And, and that's not righteousness. Righteousness is when we get deliverance and we come to the Lord and we are prayed for. We confess our sins and we're prayed for and we resist the devil. We just will not do it. We stay with it till we get the victory over it. That's righteousness. Righteousness in forsaking the world. Righteousness in not giving in to the appetites and desires of our flesh. Not giving in to it, but rather finding our joy in the Lord. We find our joy in the assembling. I look forward to coming to the assembly. We, we had... Those of you that didn't get here until 6 o'clock, you missed one of the best parts of the service. We marched in here for about 25 minutes. There weren't many of us, but we just marched and marched and marched in the aisle to the music, kids. There weren't many of us, but it was wonderful. It was as much joy as I've ever had doing anything in the world, I'm going to tell you right now. But that's righteousness before God. And in the third realm, the realm of personal ambition, the realm that we're determined we're going to have our own way. We're just going to have our own way. We're going to do our own thing. Uh, pride enters in there. Uh, the desire to be seen. The desire to be something. So you're not just uh, uh, nothing, you know. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, one of the most blessed places of peace and joy is when you finally get the victory over desiring to be seen and to be somebody of importance. And that can be very difficult for us. We don't want to just be nobody, you know. No, uh, well, not everyone is afflicted with the same thing, but for some of us, that's very difficult. If, if we're not something, just a cut above everybody else, we're difficult, we're, we find it difficult. But uh, I like to say, if your heart is right in righteousness, when you're up in glory and the royal parade starts, and I tell you, God has an army. Armageddon is coming, and we're being prepared for it now. I don't know how long it is. Oh, but I want you to know the host is mobilizing. You don't fight wars in a second. That Gulf War, I got a book from Bill Campillo, and I tell you, the electronics alone in that war, the technical planning that went into that so blew my mind, I couldn't even grasp it. I couldn't begin to grasp it. I am so far behind the times in the technology of war fighting that I, 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 
I'm out of it, you know, I'm out of it. It makes Star Wars look like a Model T. Uh, the complexity of the, of the electronic and technical aspects of the Gulf War and uh, what they're doing subsequently to improve their serve is just, Doug, it is so far beyond anything we ever heard of that it's just only engineers can even understand the vocabulary. It is so, well, the word is, um, exotic. It's just exotic. It's just nothing you'd ever dream of. Well, how do I get on that subject? The war. Now, if you're up there and you're preparing, and there goes a parade, and somebody hands you a broom and a shovel, <laughs> you know what your job is. And if you can't rejoice and praise the Lord, you got a problem inside. It's called unrighteousness. Listen, if somebody has to shovel behind the horses, why shouldn't it be you? If we do what we do to the glory of God, whether it's preaching or picking up a candy wrapper at the back of the church, in the sight of our Father, they're one and the same. It's just among men that we receive glory. But in the sight of our God, we don't receive any glory for being prominent. And when we get that down in our soul, we find peace. Peace and joy. Now, it's something well worth cultivating. This ability to, as Paul said, I can, I can rejoice in being exalted I can rejoice in being abased. I have learned whatsoever state I am in to be content. And that, that lowliness is characteristic of Jesus. That humility is characteristic of God. And if you want to be a friend of God, cultivate humility. The president of the Bible school that I attended had a dream. And in that dream, he was standing behind a large banqueting table circled around with men, God's elders. And here he was girded as a servant, and he was waiting on them. I suppose you had that dream. How would you feel? Here's the president of a Bible school. You see, that thing, God, that which is highly esteemed among men is not highly esteemed by the Lord. And so the area of righteousness has to be cultivated in the area of realizing that our joy and our security is not in the world. It's not coming from the world. And the, the fun and the pleasure that we have is not coming from the lust of the flesh. There's other sources of joy than drugs and booze and lust and perversion. There's other realms of joy. But to get freed from the world and to get freed from the flesh is difficult. It's a battle because your flesh is against you, your soul is against you, people are against you, the culture is against you, everything around you is pushing you in the wrong direction. And then finally on this pride bit where we've got to be seen, where we've got to be important, it's very difficult for us if that is our problem. And we have to say, oh God, and, and God does things like Brian was talking about, others were talking about that he just brings us down to where we realize that God alone is exalted. God alone. And our joy is when the Lord is exalted. Praise the Lord. Now, that is the three realms of right. When, when we say righteousness, we're talking about setting our affection on things above rather than on things in the earth, walking in self-control, and being humble. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. That's righteous, not vague. 
It is very real. And let your light so shine before man, that's the light. Loving God, self-control, and being humble. People know when we're humble. How, how, how many know that? When anybody has pride, you can feel it. We're the only ones that don't know it. Everybody else knows it. <laughs> they love us anyway. But all these three things are unrighteousness until we get the victory. Now, if you'll know, and that's all, that's the three ways Christ was tempted. That's the three ways every son of God is tempted in those three areas. Now, in Psalms 18 and verse 20, we're talking this morning, and if you weren't here, I urge you to get the two tapes because a tremendous, a tremendous confusion exists in the church world regarding righteousness. Part of it is due to a, a way of interpreting the Bible that is called dispensationalism. And I expect all of us in here have been exposed to that. But it teaches that we today are in a dispensation of grace. And I want to realize that the dispensational model of theological interpretation is no more than a hundred and forty, thirty, forty odd years old. Well, let's see. It, we're talking about 1850, so. All right. What dispensationalism has done for us, it has made a verse like Psalms 1820 mean nothing. It has wiped it off the books because we're under grace, not under law. Yet, we go back to the Old Testament and we read the 23rd Psalm, and we just think, oh, the promises in the book are mine. Have you ever seen that, Andy? You're old church, man. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. I am trusting in the word divine. Every promise in the book is mine. Except Psalms 1820. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing that has done that is this dispensationalism, this concept that we don't have to be righteousness because Christ is righteous and he has given us his righteousness. Therefore, this verse is made uh, incompetent. It just has no bearing. How many see the problem? I mean, we, there's no, we have no business as Christians reading these verses if evangelical doctrine is true because it's saying, it's not my righteousness but his, and then we wilt. Didn't you know that what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to say, it's not my righteousness but his, and wilt. Well, what that is, is error. And it comes... Whenever you take part of the scriptures and don't take the rest of it, you get error. And you can do that with any, you can do that with any aspect of the scripture, whether you're talking about grace or whether you're talking about predestination used to be overdone and, uh, and then a holiness has been overdone, uh, meaning visible, external holiness and thing, not the presence of God, but the other things, or lack of uh, or, or the sky is the limit, what we call greasy grace, that has been overdone. It comes from not taking the whole Bible, the whole thought. Okay? Now, the Lord, now, it can be expressed simply. It's no big deal that you have to have a, a doctor's degree from Yale to understand it. Jesus did not come to do away with man's need for righteousness. He did not do that. He came to make it possible for us to live righteously. And that's the difference. But that difference is between heaven and hell. It, the Lord gave us 
his body and blood, didn't he? He gave us the ministries. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us the born-again experience. To what end? None of these are ends in themselves. To what end? To make us in his image. That's what we're called to be in God's image. And it says in Ephesians 4, he gave apostles and so on, until we all come right to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's why he's given us everything is so that we can become in God's image, in his moral image. Does that make sense to you? Well, then, where does imputed righteousness? I was taught that, when, that Christ gave me his righteousness. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. When you were saved, when you accepted the Lord, you came as a sinner, and you were undone, you had the spirit of the devil in you. You had been born in sin and, and formed in lawlessness. And you came to the Lord, and the Lord forgave you, and he threw over you the robe of righteousness, just like Boaz, the Jew, threw the robe of righteousness over Ruth, the Moabite, Gentile. And that's what Jesus has done for you and me. He has thrown that robe over us, and when Boaz did that to Ruth, she became an Israelite and the great-grandmother of King David. You become an Israelite when Jesus throws his robe over you because it betokens marriage. Well... What righteousness do we have now? The righteousness of the Lord. Perfect. That's absolutely scriptural. It's nothing we earned. It is given to us as the gift of God willingly on his part. All right. Now, it's the therefore. The problems with biblical interpretation have to do with the therefore. You say, th men say therefore, and then they deduce. See, they say, therefore, because that's true, because he put his robe on me, therefore this is true, therefore that is true. But one thing you learn about interpreting the Bible is don't make therefores. Let the Bible supply the therefore. And the therefore of the Bible is not that from now on you are eternally righteous no matter what you do. The Bible in many places in the New Testament speaks directly against that. It's a therefore, but not the right therefore. The correct therefore is now that Jesus has forgiven you and has given you his righteousness so that, for the purpose of being able to go past the veil into the mercy seat so that God can hear your prayers. Otherwise, you couldn't get off base one. He has given us his blood so that we can go beyond the veil, approach the Holy of Holies, and pray before the mercy seat for our help in the time of need and our struggle against sin. Okay. Now, the Lord has made us his problem. He has said, I will marry these people if they will accept my proposal. I will marry them. And so I will bring into myself all this imperfection, all this that is not right, but I am doing this because this is the way I'm going to have my bride. I've got to take her as she is. 
I can't wait till she's perfect because I'm the one that has to make her perfect. So I've got to marry her first. So he marries us, and then guess what he does? What do you think he does after that? He begins to cleanse us. And so the Christian life, the, the true Christian life, is a daily interaction with Jesus to make us a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Do you see that when he gave us his righteousness to our account, the purpose of that was not so that we could then stumble through life and be carried to paradise when we died. That was not the purpose of giving us his righteousness. It was to enable us to begin to enter into the program of becoming a new creature. Now, this, this is so important because the promises that we associate with being a Christian, for example, a glorified body, a crown of life, to be part of the Lord's bride, part of him, to rule the nations, to be part of the royal priesthood. All of these promises are based on overcoming. They're based on overcoming. And the inference in the scripture is clear. If you do not overcome, you do not receive the promises associated with Christianity. For example, in Revelation, the third chapter, it says this. Speaking of the church in Sardis, it says you have a few names. You have a few names in Sardis, which will walk with me in white, for they are worth it. And the inference is clear. The majority will not walk with Jesus in white. Now, to not walk with the Lord in white means that you are not part of the priesthood. You are not part of the body. Now, listen to another scripture. This is from John 15. Every branch in me now, is that referring to a Christian or a non-Christian? Every branch in me, okay, he prunes it. Every branch in Jesus that does not bear fruit, the fruit that God is looking for is his image. His image, that's the fruit, the fruit of righteousness. What does he do? He cuts it off. It is removed from the vine. John 15. It is cut off from the vine. And it says, men gather them in bundles and they are burned. Well, I don't have to go on with that anymore. I don't have to go on with that anymore. You can see as plain as anything ever was that the current understanding of salvation is incorrect. It is destructively incorrect. It has left people with the idea that this initial assignment of righteousness, which was intended to give us access to where we could begin the walk with God, is some kind of an eternal overlooking of sin so that no matter what you do forever, no judgment, no problems or anything can touch you. The result of this misunderstanding is a destroyed Christian church throughout the world. And so we find that people from this church, I'll brag on this church a little, and I'm sure there are others that are uh, just as fine, maybe much better for all I know. Well, when people from this church go to another church, the first thing they notice is the carelessness, the way people live. 
that they say, well, you know, what is this? These people aren't even trying. We're not perfect, but we're trying. You see? And it comes from being taught continually that Christ has given you his righteousness and he's finished the job and it's all over. There's no more battle. There's nothing else to do. Relax. He has won the war. A totally incorrect view of salvation and one that will lead to passivity, to sin, and finally to destruction. Does that make any sense to you? In a way, it's subtle. It's kind of hard to grasp, but in another way, it's pretty simple. All that we're saying is, if you're a Christian, act like it. Now, therefore, Psalms 18.20, where it says, The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, is still entirely applicable. If you live a righteous life by the help of the Lord, you will be blessed. Now, the Jews missed God's plan of righteousness by turning away from God and worshiping the law, the Torah, and the statutes, and the ordinances, and all the little uh, things from the Talmud, and all the rest. Instead of worshiping and looking unto God, they're looking unto the Talmud. See? And so, so Paul says, you didn't seek it by faith, but by the works. But God, but the commandment's perfect. The Torah is perfect, but you have to... Approach it by faith in Jesus. You can't worship the word. I remember praying at the Western Wall. And there was an elderly Jew on my left praying at the wall. And he had on his, in his hand some papers torn out of a pad, it looked like. And he had a little tiny Hebrew writings. Those were his prayers. He was a very devout man. He was there at the wall. And he was doubling slightly, and he was saying his prayers, and he'd put one paper behind the other and say those prayers. One, one page like that. Now, we Christians have missed God's intention not by fasting on works, but by saying Christ did it all. There's nothing we have to do, and just ignoring 80% of the New Testament writings, starting with the gospel. Just wiped it out and said, he did it all. There's no more battle. It's finished. So in both cases, what was destroyed? Righteousness. The one thing God wants, which is people who will behave themselves and not lie and not lust and not swear and not be walking around in pride and not sit in front of the television. The one thing God wanted, he's not getting, the Jews missed it by fastening on things of the, wor of the written words, and we Gentiles have missed it by a, an incorrect understanding of Christ. We have taken what Paul wrote and have twisted it and have destroyed ourselves. Time for revival. It's, it's, it's time for us to... to they got, you know, there's many a time in history that people, both in Jewish history and in, and in more recent history, when people have rediscovered the word. <laughs> they go back to the Bible. Now, <coughs> so, this psalm is for warriors. This is for warriors. And God is moving us toward war. Don't you feel in your bones? Oh, you can feel that militant joy and that righteous. We were around here parading around here. I tell you, you can't, you can't act like that, young or old, for that long unless <laughs> something's working. I tell you, it felt so good. I had a stupid going. It was so wonderful. All right. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness. Brother Thompson, we don't have any righteousness. Oh, yes, we do. When you're tempted to commit adultery, and instead you go to the Lord and you ask him to take that thing out of you and you overcome that, that is your righteousness. Where did it come from? 
came originally from Jesus because without him, we wouldn't have had the chance of a snowball in Texas. Yeah? We wouldn't have had a chance. We wouldn't have had the forgiveness to start with. We wouldn't have had the word. We wouldn't have had the blood. We wouldn't have had the born again. Sure, it all comes from Jesus. But we need to get away from that thought, you know. He's righteous and I'm not. He wants us to be in his image. He wants us in his image. We can't do it, but he can. But it requires overcoming the things that hinder. All right. And if you, if you do overcome your pride, if you do overcome your love of the world, if you do overcome the desires of your flesh, the Lord will reward you. You don't have to walk around in gloom and doom and say, oh, I hate being a Christian. I can't do anything. I can't watch the television and I can't get drunk and I can't uh, strut around and uh, I can't do nothing. That, that's no Christian life. Yeah. You know that holiness, do you know what it is? It's the presence of God. Holiness is the presence of God. And God will not put up with a miserable people. You, he won't have it. He's a king. You remember when uh, Nehemiah went in before the king? He was the king's cupbearer, and his face was sad, and he was saying to himself, if I get out of here alive, I'll be doing well, because you don't come with a sad countenance before the king. It's an insult to his majesty. You read about that, Nehemiah. He was all crestfallen, and, and he went in, and who, the king wants to see you happy. Whether well, you feel happy or not, the king wants you happy, unless you went, you know, off with your head. So Nehemiah was scared silly, but he was trying to do something, and he got away with it, but it was very dangerous for the king's cupbearer to come looking sad in the presence of majesty, because that's an insult to his majesty. And Jesus is a king people. He is a king, and his going is stately and majestic with his counselors and his mighty commanders and his warriors. Yeah, he's a real king, and he has all this stuff with him when he moves. It's majestic. And you don't come into the presence, and that's holiness, and you don't come into that presence, that holiness, all down in the mouth, because it's an insult to his majesty. You come in rejoicing, you come in praising, whether you feel it or not. You say, hallelujah, Lord, I, I, I appreciate your goodness and your glory. Holiness, joy, and strength go together. Holiness, joy, and strength go together. Praise the Lord. So we're not a gloomy people. We don't look on it as we're giving up. Oh, I'm, I've given up Las Vegas. I've given up Las Vegas. I can't go and gamble at it. Oh, That's the way you feel. Oh, I can't get plastered anymore. Oh, God, what am I going to do? I can't get soused, Mary. I can't get soused anymore. The Lord won't let me. Is that the way we're living? I'm not living that way. Oh, God, I can't watch the television. Oh, God, what's the use of even living? My life's nothing to me. Can't watch the television. Huh? And nobody sees me. I'm nothing in the church. Oh, God, I might as well go out and do it all in because nobody knows that I'm here. <laughs> Is that the way I feel? I don't feel that way. Huh? Praise the Lord. All right. Now, the, the Lord rewards us with other things. There's other things that are better. And we come in. And the Lord says, that's right, that's my majesty, that's my holiness. Rejoice in my presence. Rejoice in my presence. I haven't come to take away anything. I will not be in your debt. Don't crawl around here like a dragged down thing in my sight. I have the wealth of all the universe to give you. I'm the greatest king there is. And you come crawling into my sight? Oh, no. We come in and we praise the Lord in his majesty, in his holiness. And glorify him because he has given us life and food and strength and understanding and all kinds of good things. We have no cause to go moping into the presence of God. According to the cleanness of my hands, he recompenses us with sound health. Strong families. Doesn't happen all at once. You can't come out of a life of sin. 
and expect that within a very short time you're going to be completely healed, body, soul, and spirit, and domestically and every other way. It isn't going to happen. It takes time. But as you stay with the program, the healing comes. It may take 10 years, it may take 15 years, but eventually the physical healing comes, the family healing comes. It's, it takes time as God begins to work out all these details. It'll come, but it takes time. If your hands are clean, for I have kept the ways of the Lord. Now, we can't do that in our own strength, but by Jesus' help, we can keep the ways of the Lord. And we're commanded. We have to keep. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, if you love me, say it 15 times. Do what I said. You know? <laughs> uh, and have not wickedly departed from my God. Now, when we are a Christian, born again, washed in the blood, and we depart from our God, that is wickedness. I'll show you that very thing. I'll show you that very thing. How many here have ever raised pigs? Anybody? Janet, have you raised pigs at all? Janet's sister raised pigs. Well, over in 2 Peter... There's something addressed to the porkers. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, we have two dogs at our house. They're Russian wolfhounds. They rush in the house and wolf down their food. All right, now, 2 Peter 2.20. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How many see that salvation is an escape from defilement? It's not just an imputed legal stance before God. It's something you come out of the filth of the world. All right? They are again entangled in them and are overcome. Either you overcome or you are overcome. Right? Is that right? All right. The last state has become worse for them than the first. All right? For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. So righteousness is a way of life. Is that right? Righteousness is a way of life. It says the way of righteousness, not the state of righteousness, the way of righteousness. And then having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now is that an Old Testament commandment or a New Testament commandment? Yeah, really, it's both. But most specifically, it's New Testament. Here's a New Testament Jewish apostle saying there's a commandment, and what is the commandment? Live a holy life. Live a holy life, right? It isn't true that Jesus has done it all. That is not true. That is not true. There's a battle. There's a race. There's a warfare. There's a way of righteousness. Okay. The holy commandment. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit. Now, that's very graphic. And it is not very nice. And it tells us what is true of people who having come out of the filth of the world, go back into them. Now, we've all seen dogs do that because they don't have better sense. They just don't have better sense. You may be a dog fancier, but dogs do, are not strong in that department. <laughs> a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. Now, I've read about pigs, and they say pigs much prefer a clean pen. Janet, does that square with what you've heard? I've heard that they prefer to be clean. But people have given them a bad name, 
And so here they are in the Bible. A sow, that's a mother pig, after you get her all washed off, well, she returns and wallows. Well, maybe that's all she's got to mess with. It. But in any case, the Bible is clear. It is not that you accept Jesus and then everything is over. You no more effort. You lay back on your feather bed and wait to go to heaven. It simply is not true. You will end up back in the mire. I have not wickedly, when we depart, it is wickedness, isn't it, Earl? When we depart from the holy commandment, it is wickedness, wickedness on our part. Oh, God, uh, he just sees me in Jesus. That is not true. That is not true. It's a misapplication of the scripture. Otherwise, why not just go out and live in fornication and lust and drunkenness and worldliness? If God's going to see you in Jesus and you're going to be perfect, huh? It's not true. It's terrible. It even believes such a thing as to reproach God and to, uh, to ascribe wickedness to God. They would ever participate in such a thing. For all his ordinances were before me. How many know that in the first psalm it says to meditate in his law day and night? Hey, you hungry? Did you ever do that? No. Well, I've been trying to do something, and here I am, late in life, over the hill, and so I started off to start memorizing in Genesis 1-1 in Hebrew, as well as Joel chapter 2 in Hebrew. And that is more fun than a barrel of monkeys, because... It gives your mind, it, do you realize how often during the day that your mind is on something fruitless? <coughs> well, try memorizing scripture. You don't have to memorize it in Hebrew, don't you? You don't have to worry about that part. That's just my problem. <laughs> but try memorizing it every time that your brain is not occupied. Just keep re re repeating the scripture. It's amazing. You know? I can honestly breathe. Prashid bara Elohim er hashemayim ver haaretz ver haaretz hayta tohu vavohu vechoshek al penei tohom veruach Elohim er hefet al penei hamayim vayom er Elohim yihi or vayhi or and I go around like this with my mind and, and full of Joel. I, I love Joel. Uh, there's a part in Joel that's so graphic. It goes, Yom Choshek, uh, Avafela, Yom Anan Varafel, Keshachar, Al Perus, Heharim, Am Rav Vatsum. And I go up and down the street, Am Rav, I'm walking up and down the street. And you see as people drive by, Larry drives by with his customers trying out the cars. You, you don't know about what's going on. Larry is Am Rav Vatsum, Am Rav Vatsum, a large army and mighty. But it does something, you know, it's healing inside your mind. It's, you're meditating, uh, the, the word is becoming part of your brain. It's, it's, it does something to you inside. Try it. In his law does he meditate day and night. For all his ordinances were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless with him. How many times has it been in evangelical teaching? There's never been anybody righteous there so anxious to prove that there are the little four steps of salvation. The Bible is full of righteous people. We take one little part of the scripture and overdo it and leave out the rest. David said, I'm blameless. And that's without being born again. That's without the body and blood of Jesus. I was blameless before him. And that's just the natural man. How much more? And that's why Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. How do we exceed it? Because they had to keep it by guts and by golly. We've got divinity within us. We've got the divine nature within us. How much more should we come before God and say, I have kept the ways of the Lord. I walked... You say, but nobody's perfect. This is not talking about somebody being perfect. David was not perfect. It means at that time, at that moment, his conscience was clear. You can't be perfect for tomorrow. You have to be perfect for right now. 
And if you're not perfect for right now, you ought to be. That means you've got sin in your life. That means you don't leave this church tonight without repenting. God doesn't want you walking with sin in your life. But you're not going to be perfect for tomorrow. There'll be new evil tomorrow, new challenges tomorrow. But God wants you perfect right now. Right now. I did not put away his statutes. I was blameless. And I kept myself from my iniquity. Do you realize how much iniquity we can actually keep ourselves from? We don't have to have the Lord send a thunderbolt. You just don't do it. You do the gospel of the shoes. You eschew evil. You walk away from it in your shoes. That's called eschewing evil. You walk away from it, Pat. When you know if you go into a certain situation, you're going to cave. Did you ever do that? You walk around, you knew you were going to blow it. You knew you were going to blow it and walked right into it. Did you ever do that? That's where the gospel of the shoes works. You turn around in your shoes and you don't go in there because you're going to fall and you know you're going to fall, so don't do it. You got any idea how practical that is? Uh, I kept myself. From my lawlessness or iniquity or breaking God's law. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness. Now, I want to mention a little something about divine healing. I want to mention something about divine healing. Now, healing, divine healing, and the gifts of healing came into prominence in early Pentecost at the turn of the century, but it was revived in the 40s. It was revived. The gifts of healing were revived. And the concept of divine healing. Well, today it's fairly, pretty fairly well accepted. But in those days it was not well accepted, particularly by the Baptists who who are dead against it. And I don't think they are so much anymore, but they were at that time. But I think most of us in this room believe in that God can heal you. But what happened was, or what has happened is, that it has become a thing separate from our walk in Jesus. Now, God intends healing, I think, along two lines along two lines. One is that as a sign. In Mark 16, it says, these signs shall follow them that believe. And God, when there's, uh, God has in certain times used people like Amy Semper McPherson and, and uh, Catherine Kuhlman and others, and great multitudes of people have come to see those signs. A sign, and it brings people to the Lord. Well, there's another way in which healing works that is not a sign. It's part of the atonement. And it says, by his stripes ye were healed. Now that's not talking about healing as a gift or as a sign. It's talking about healing as part of the atonement. And the way that works is where it says, I would that you be in health and prosper as your soul prospers. It is part of the package of the divine redemption. And I think God wants to accent that today because we've gone too much over into divorcing healing from being part of the Christian life. So people end up, if they have a problem, and I'm talking about experienced Christian people, instead of going to the Lord, and finding out his will and working with God, they run here and there looking for someone to heal them. And that's not the Lord's will. That is not the Lord's will. That's not the way healing is supposed to operate. That if you, if you go to the right place at the right time and you get the right minister, you'll be healed. That's not what God wants. I'll guarantee it. First, it's for a sign, and that is for the unsaved. That is to bring in... Crowds of people, and whenever the gifts of healing are operate, people come by the thousands. You can't keep them away. You can't get a building big enough to hold people when the gifts are healing 
are working. I've seen that in the Catherine Kuhlman meeting. People are starting at 4 o'clock, pressed up against the gate, couldn't get in. Visitors came from, from other states and couldn't even get into the auditorium. They had to sit out and watch the meeting on closed circuit TV. The gift of healing does that. If you've never been where someone has a true gift of healing, you can't imagine the power of the angel of the Lord that is present there that draws, but it's different from anything you've ever experienced. The miracle power is there, and you know it, and you can feel it, and it draws people from all over the place, in wheelchairs and hobbling and everything. It looks like the first century when Jesus was operating, when someone has a true gift of healing, like William Branham or... Uh, uh, whose meetings uh, I've been in, and also Catherine Kuhlman that we have seen in operation. And it's something else. It's different from anything you've ever seen. But outside of that, God does not want us looking to people for healing. He wants us looking, we who are experienced, we're not unsaved. We don't need healing for a sign. We believe, okay? So we go for healing as part of the atonement. And the way that works is when we go to the Lord, if we have a sickness, it, I'm not saying God will heal you instantly. I'm not saying God will ever heal you in this world. It, it's not something, it doesn't work that way. It works as part of the atonement as God is working with your individual personality. And when you come to God with that, keeping your faith high, because the Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. But healing is the children's bread. And it's something, it's one of these rewards that comes to us as a result of righteousness. Now, I've been healed several times, several times in my life. You're looking at somebody that wore glasses from the time he was seven. And I haven't worn glasses for 20 years. But before God healed me, I was wearing bifocals, and I couldn't uh, read uh, well at all unless it was large, pretty large letters. And, and when God healed me, it was instantaneous. I hadn't been prayed for. I hadn't been prayed for. I prayed for somebody else two nights previous for healing. But I hadn't asked for myself. I figured, well, God's given me money to have glasses. I'm not hung up on healing. I, I, on uh, uh, glasses, I, I've seen people. I remember there was one healer that used to come into the church, a big evangelist, and he had an anvil. He would bring an anvil with him, old blacksmith's anvil. And to show your faith, you were supposed to come up. He had a hammer and an anvil, and you put your glasses on the anvil, and they'd smash them. Yeah, that's the way they did in those days. And uh, there was a girl in Bible school, and she went to that meeting, and she put her glasses on the anvil, and they smashed them. But she wasn't healed. Her eyes were terrible and bloodshot, and uh, finally she had to get another pair of glasses. So that, there was nothing real about that. But when God healed my eyes... I can still look at a watch, read the small, bring up your watch, I'll show you. I can read that little stuff in there. And, uh, and you know, I could no more do, I couldn't even read the face of the watch, let alone this, you know, like where it says, uh, what is it, quartz and other things, tiny, tiny, tiny stuff, you know, I can read that. But I couldn't read the face of the watch without my bifocals. 20 years ago, I know what healing is. I've been healed of arthritis. Audrey was healed of a chronic uh, thyroid condition. She, it was so spectacular. I mean, she was prayed for in New York, and it was so spectacular that when she went to the doctor, which she did on a regular basis, for, uh, she went, she said, every time I take my medication, I'm climbing the wall. What is wrong with me? And he tested her, and her thyroid was healed, and the kind she had doesn't, you don't outgrow it. It's lifelong. You're born with it. That's it. This never ends. And the doctor had to admit, whatever happened to you, you don't have a problem anymore with your thyroid. So the Lord spoke to her, spoke to Audrey. She wasn't getting prayed for, and, and told her through a circumstance that happened in our family that he, why didn't she ask him for healing? You should ask for healing. You should ask for it. 
And she had never asked him for healing. And the Lord said to her, through an experience, to ask him for healing. It was the children's bread for this thyroid thing. So she went uh, and she asked an evangelist at a meeting up in the Elam Bible Institute in, in New York, Rochester area, and he prayed for her. And she was healed. A miracle, an absolute miracle. But it was part of a righteous life. The Lord spoke to her. She didn't go chasing all over the countryside to get healed from the thyroid condition. The Lord worked that out as part of her redemption. And the Lord worked out with me, with my eyes, with anxiety, with arthritis, uh, just as part, one time a printing press fell on my knee. It's a wonder it didn't cut my leg off. But within a few hours, it was almost totally healed. I mean, everything was gone. Swelling, everything was gone. I was just a flat-out miracle. But that's the way God wants it to be. He wants it to be part, just a natural thing of an overcoming life. Now, sometimes there may be in our family a sickness, or we may have a sickness. It doesn't work. That doesn't work like that. And in that case, God is doing something else, just like some part of our personality that doesn't change the way we'd want it. It's the redemption. It works according to God's plan. Do you see that? So the Lord recompenses us according to righteousness. And what God wants stress today doesn't he want gifts? Sure. I think gifts are going to be springing forth. I, I don't know if Maurice has a gift or not. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this. But I'll, I'll declare that Saturday I asked him to pray for somebody, and he went off like a bomb. I never I wasn't. I can't believe it was Maurice. How many were here? I mean, he. I can't describe it. You'd have had to been here to understand. But at least... I didn't ask the person that was prayed for what happened to him, but there were two other people that got hit going by that said, wow, you know, it hit them too and made a difference in their life. So, so at the time you least expect it, if we're serving the Lord and we're going along in him, and that's the way gifts and things come forth and the way God wants them in the body. We don't go out and seek them. If we will concentrate on righteous and pleasing God, then God will give us the things that we need, the gifts, the healings, and all the rest. Just look to Jesus. We don't have to look around for gifted people. Just look to Jesus. And if he wants you to go to a gifted person, he will tell you, like he did Audrey's, go up and be prayed for, and she was. So it's different for every person, but it's part of the Christian life. Does that make sense to you? It'll work. It'll work. Amen. Now, I said that if there's something in your life that is not right, and you know it, you need to come to the altar right now. You need to. You don't. It is not part of the Christian life to live with a guilty conscience. It's not part of the Christian life. You can't get tomorrow's victories now but it's what God is dealing with now. If there is something in your life and it's not right, and you know it, you need to come up right now to the altar because we're going on with the music service, so it'll be between you and God, and maybe we'll send up somebody to pray with you. But if you've got something in your life, and I mentioned three areas of sin, and there's something in there that's bothering you, it's not right, you haven't taken the time to tell the Lord, this is wrong, I want it out, Lord. And you need to come right now. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You need to come right now. You don't walk around with unconfessed sin or with things that bother you. You say, I'll get it later. You won't get it later. You get tricked later and get hurt. The time to get it is now. If there's something in your life. And you don't have to go searching for it. You, know, you don't have to pick it yourself. Like this. Is this wrong? Just if there's something you know has been troubling you, it's not right, it hasn't been really brought clean before the Lord, now's the time to do it. Hallelujah. So you won't go out of this church with a troubled conscience. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now's the time. Now is the time. 
Am I to assume that no one here has any problems? Is that correct? Hands are clean. You know, there's an old Methodist expression, save sanctified up to date. That's it. Hey? Save sanctified up to date. You can't get it for tomorrow. And there's another old expression they used to use, keeping short accounts with God. And don't let that account drag out, you know, get 30, 45 days in arrears. Huh? You keep a short account with God. Pay your bills quick. Huh? Anybody here with one going out in arrears here? You can't hardly straggle out of your seat. Let's stand. Maybe that'll make it easier for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Save sanctified up to date. Are you saved sanctified up to date? Hallelujah. Come on. We're not going to wait much longer, but I want to give you the chance. If there's something that needs to be addressed directly, now's the time. People, we're going to war. How many know that? I mean, the army's starting to move. And you want to cherish your place in the army more of a treasure than anything else in your life is your place in this army. It's an honor. It's an honor. You realize what a small minority of the earth's population is even aware that God has an army. You know what we are? We're like commandos in an enemy territory plotting the overthrow of the present regime. Do you realize that? <laughs> we look at the world and say, go on, have your fun. Someday we're going to be in charge. Huh? We're like secret agents in an alien country getting ready, plotting the overthrow of the present regime. Just think of that. It's very heavy and very serious and very real. And you want to cherish that place that God has called you to be in his army. And, and it's characteristic of each member of the army when they see one little thing wrong, one little thing, bang, they're on their knees there getting that thing right. They can't stand not being perfect in the sight of the commander-in-chief. Praise the Lord. I always want to give you a chance to come. Make sure those three areas are covered. The love of the world, the love of sin, and the love of self. Get those nailed down because they're not in God's army. Amen. They march in their rank. They're already dead. They're dead living people. They fall on the sword of the word of God. It doesn't hurt them. It's already killed them. Praise the Lord. And they are very much alive. Hallelujah. I think we're ready for the musicians. By the way, we have a need of some ladies at the altar here. Well, whenever we're playing and also people at the altar, then we need others at the altar.